Hi guys, it's Mr. Y. Today we're going to talk about the background information that you should already know about classification, which is going to be our next unit. So most of the stuff we're going to talk about in this short lecture is really mostly review that we talked about earlier this year, and now it's going to kind of all come together in um, this unit of classification in terms of how we sort and categorize different living things in the world. All right, there are some terms that you got to make sure you keep straight, and all these should be terms that are already familiar to you. The first two are unicellular and multicellular. Unicellular simply means an organism who's only one cell big, so that would be something like a bacteria, would be an example. Multicellular means, well, more than one cell, multiple cells, so anything that includes plants, animals, funguses, fungi, and protists as well. Um, there is another group that goes in with the unicellulars, another type of bacteria called archaea that's very similar to bacteria. Archaea, I'll just put it there. But usually if you mean unicellular, you're talking about bacteria and archaea. If you're talking multicellular, you're talking plants, animals, fungus, protists, things that you can actually see with your naked eye. The next two terms should hopefully be very familiar by this point, autotrophic and heterotrophic. Autotrophs, otherwise known as producers, make their own food internally, usually through photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesis, but sometimes also through chemosynthesis, but most of the times it's photosynthesis. So if it's an autotroph, usually it appears green, like plants do. Not always, though. Heterotrophs are the consumers, those that must ingest their own food. So while autotrophs might be plants and some bacteria and some protists, there are a few protists that can do photosynthesis, heterotrophs, consumers, would include all the animals, all the um, funguses, excuse me, funguses don't do photosynthesis, they eat dead decaying matter, and a few protists as well. Protists kind of jump the gap here. And yes, there are a few plants that are also heterotrophic, such as the Venus flytrap, but most of the time plants fall under the category of autotrophic. Now, the last two sets for this page Prokaryotes and eukaryotes, again, should be familiar to you by this time. Prokaryotes are cells that have no membrane-bound organelles. In other words, they have no nucleus. They have no ribosomes. They, I'm assuming they have no um, endoplasmic reticulum. They have no mitochondria. They have no um, Golgi apparatus. They have none of the major organelles that you guys have studied. What they do have, they do have DNA in a nucleoid region, and they have RNA. They also do have ribosomes. I'm sorry, I misspoke before. They will be um, surrounded by a cell wall in many cases, and they will always have a cell membrane, and oftentimes they'll have other little appendage features, because most of the time prokaryotes and unicellular um, go with, together with the same type of creatures we're talking about. So mo almost all, no, all bacteria are in fact prokaryotes. Um, eukaryotes, on the other hand, are organisms whose cells do, in fact, have a nucleus, an endoplasmic reticulum, a rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi bodies, mitochondria or chloroplasts. Um, keep in mind, if it's a chloroplast, it's probably a plant. Not Animal cells don't have chloroplasts because we don't do photosynthesis. All those organelles we studied about first semester. And the last two terms, you got to make sure you are clear on the differences for for classification is sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction means that the genetic information in DNA is exchanged between two partners to make a genetically distinct individual. So in other words, you have to have two parents. Whereas asexual reproduction is more akin to like cloning, and it usually only applies to the prokaryotes who are unicellular. So simple single cell bacterium that just replicate. Um, the, the offspring is a genetic identical version of the parent. You can call it a clone if you wish, but 
it's got the exact same DNA. There's no shuffling of genes. So it's basically this process is by something similar to mitosis, whereas this one, as we've talked about before, requires meiosis. You can see in the cartoon here this little case of um, bacteria exchanging DNA would indicate a sexually reproducing version of bacteria. All right, so classification. Classification is defined as the grouping of organisms based upon their similarities. And in reverse, you could also say it's also the grouping of organisms based upon their differences as well. So we often look at similarities, but we also look at the differences as well to help us out. So I've given you here nine, or excuse me, yeah, nine creatures. We have a tulip, a rose, a cottonwood tree, a crocodile, an oak tree, a bat, elk, lizard, and a bass. That's a fish, in case you don't know what a bass is. So let's let me do this in yellow. Fish. And I'd like you to try and put them into as many different groups as you can, keeping at least two of them together if possible. So if you were to group these things, well, how could we do it? Well, one possible answer is, well, you could put the tulip and the rose together because while they are other plants, these are the only flowers. And the oak and the cottonwood are both plants as well, but they are trees. The bat and the elk, they're animals, just like the bass, the crocodile, and the lizard, but these are specifically mammals. They have fur, produce milk, and give birth to live young. The bass is the only animal that is a fish, but it's still an animal. And then you have crocodile and lizards, which are members of the reptile category. So you can kind of see what I've done here is I've separated them based upon first plants, then animals, and then I broke down the categories even further to be more specific. With the plants, we broke it down further to be flowers, with uh, flowers or trees, excuse me. With the animals, we broke it down to be either mammals, fish, or reptiles. And so, Here's another way of showing this exact same answer. So if you didn't copy it down last time, make sure you get it copied down this time. Again, we've made two larger categories with the subcategories underneath of it. So here are the main categories, and these lead to the subcategories. And this is kind of how classification works. You start with the major differences, and you work down to smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller differences. And thus, you keep getting groups that are made up of fewer organisms as you go. And we often imply evolutionary relationships based upon how we classify things. Because remember, from evolution, we assume that the more similarities two organisms have to each other, the more closely related they are. That is to say, the more recent the, more re the common ancestor between them is, historically speaking, on the geologic scale. So, <clears throat> based upon that group we were just working with, if I was to draw an evolutionary tree, where here is the common ancestor to all the creatures. So these would be a eukaryotic ancestor, because they're all eukaryotes. Eukaryotic multi-cell ancestor. Because they all all eukaryotes and are multicellular. One branch would be specific to just the plants, while the other branch would be specific to just the animals. We don't have any funguses, or I'd have to make a third branch as well. And within the different branches, you see, again, we're going to try and sort these by how closely they are related. Now, there's only two plant groups we talked about, the flower and the tree. So those are kind of easy to figure out. It doesn't matter which one goes where. But on this last one with the animals, we had three groups. We had fish, the bass, the reptiles, and the mammals. And again, you have to ask yourself, well, which ones probably have an ancestor more recently with each other than they do with each other, within the third? And the answer comes in the fact that reptiles and mammals are, of course, vertebrates. They have an internal skeleton, and fish are, for the most part, vertebrates as well, but these are land vertebrates. So this would be a common, common land vertebrate ancestor. And while fish, as I said, are also vertebrates, so technically there's a vertebrate ancestor for all three of them, probably are, you know, back here, fish obviously don't have that land aspect to them. 
So I put the reptiles and the mammals on the last two strands closer together because the difference in the time they've been separated is probably less than the difference between either of those two and something like fish. And again, you'll have to remember that this is past and this is present time. And we're talking on the huge geologic time scale. So we would see the biggest differences between the two main groups, again, plants and animals would be the big difference, and the closer two branches are, the fewer differences we expect to see. Again, I put the fish more by itself first because that's an oceanic animal, oceanic vertebrate, whereas these two are both land vertebrates. And again, we expect to see the smallest, it's hard to read this, but it says smallest differences between these two. Okay. I'm going to show you one other group to give it a try for yourself and see if you can do it, but this has basically been a very short lecture on some of the background information you should have gotten out of evolution, the cell unit, and how it all kind of fits together with how we, um, this is how we associate different groups of living organisms. So I'll give you two sets of groups. You can try either one, and you should be able to make yourself a nice evolutionary tree just like I did with the last one based upon the groupings whether you have plants, animals, funguses, bacteria, protists, and then be able to show on your evolutionary tree which one has the more close relationship versus another one versus maybe another one, and maybe there's another close relationship here. So you should be able to draw your own evolutionary tree based upon what you know about these common uh, living things. Here's a third and fourth group if you wish to try, but that's going to wrap up the lecture for today, guys. So if you have questions, make sure you let me know. Again, this has just been a brief recap, so by all means, if you're having trouble with this, make sure you check with me.